back, but I think we're going to start with the Alperones, if only because of their reality show, which sounds e- either made up or like it was on Quibi. R.I.P. Quibi, you were too pure for this world. Yeah, it was, um, it was a few years back. It was a while ago, obviously. He's been dead for 12 years, but it was called Pam uh, Chaim, which in Hebrew is uh, once, once in Life or Once in a Life. Um, and it was one of these sorts of shows where you'd have different celebrities, a different celebrity personality meeting with other different celebrities. So there was a model living with them at their home in Ranana, which is a very um, kind of like nerdy, perfect little Israeli middle-class suburb where kind of like dads who work in high tech live. And, you know, it's a very nice place to grow up. So it's, it's not the type of place they usually associate with organized crime. And, um, but that, that just kind of speaks to how much of a household name he was in Israel. And today also, if we could give her a, a shout out here, his, his widow, Ahuva Alperon is something of a Instagram influencer these days. She does a lot of like cooking stuff on, uh, she's, she's pretty well known. So if you want to check it out, a lot of, uh, desserts and, uh, foods kind of like, you know, Mor- Moroccan style cooking, but also a lot of, uh, a lot of baked goods. So check out Ahuva Alperon on Instagram. Why not? <laughs> She's we been, get she's been plug, through right? a lot. She's been through a lot. She's not responsible for the things her husband did, if, even if she may have benefited from it, you know. Let's get her, let's get her to at the episode, you know. Let's get her to get her, get her uh, do some Patreon stuff. But yeah, the, the TV show, Alperone, like it wasn't, you know, America had growing up Gotti, but it wasn't like that because Alperone was still an active mafioso while the show was going on. Yeah. And the model, the model has this quote, uh, you know, from afterwards where she says, quote, you see The Sopranos, and it sounds sexy that some mafioso comes and charms you into the sunset. But in reality, it is the opposite. It is very intimidating, scary, not kosher. She said that to Yidiot Akhrano, one of the local Israeli publications. Right. Well, I would say that most uh, you know, people who are in Israeli organized crime, I would say most of them probably do keep kosher. But, but, um, but, but beyond that, <laughs> no, they do. It's the type of these guys, you know, they very often, more often than not, come from pretty traditional backgrounds. So... You know, they might kill you, but they're not going to mix milk and meat. But I would say, even though these guys tend tend to be charming and have you know strong personalities in that way, like guys and who, who are criminals very often do, uh, as part of the psychology of that personality. I think what she said does hit on a point here. Um, you know, the, the Sicilian mob and other mobs in, in the U.S. also aren't you know actually glamorous, but with the Israeli mob, it's definitely true. Uh, they don't have the same formalities and rituals and getting made in a ceremony with a, a sword and a dove and all that type of stuff you've seen in movies. They also, their their aesthetic is much more, um, you know, Hugo Boss t-shirts and Lacoste and bad sneakers. So it's not a lot of, you know, <laughs> three-piece suits and, and, and you know, $1,000 shoes and whatnot. It's a lot more informal and a lot of these guys kind of look like like scrubs and you wouldn't maybe what you would picture like a, a mafioso maybe coming from the from the states let's say that doesn't mean they yeah, won't I mean, they won't kill you all the same that they're not sophisticated they're very sophisticated a lot of these dudes but you know the uh like israelis in general with the informality a lot of you know israelis aren't going to put on a suit if it's not at their bar mitzvah so you know don't don't let that <laughs> fool you you know i was gonna say you go boss t-shirts and bad sneakers sounds like most israelis i know no disrespect um it's but yeah look. al Peroni, he, yeah he he had already developed a rep for being super accessible to the press and hence the TV show, they actually called him Israel's Tony Soprano. So Yaakov Alperon is, is the boss, was the boss. He was born in a suburb of Tel Aviv in 1955 to parents who immigrated from Egypt. And this is actually something you'll see a lot of with Israeli mafiosos, that they're of North African descent. After 1948, when Israel was created, you had an exodus of Jews in countries from countries like Morocco, Egypt, Iraq, Yemen, Syria, who were sort of forced to flee their homelands uh, Israel was generally a very poor country, but these Jews were among the most marginalized and downtrodden in the country after they came. So they're a bit overrepresented in the crime families. According to the LA Times, this is a quote from an article they wrote too, organized crime blossomed here in the 1980s and 1990s while security forces were focused on Palestinian terrorist threats. By the time Israeli authorities truly began to grapple with the problem a few years ago, they faced a sophisticated global network of gambling, prostitution, and drug trafficking, with Los Angeles as one of its hubs. There was an assassination in Encino, alliances with violent LA gangs, and the establishment of an Israeli-directed drug pipeline from Europe straight to Los Angeles and Las Vegas. Al Peron and his brothers started off, they were boxers, and they soon started demanding protection money, extorting people, that whole sort of, you know, commonplace origin story. Soon they were fighting for control of gambling rackets, extortion rackets, 
Everything from sidewalk flower vendors to bottle recycling. All sorts of rackets. There's rackets all over the place. And the bottling recycling one is, is interesting. Israel was actually a, a pretty socialist country and started to privatize in recent decades. And much like the sort of Russian oligarch grab in the 80s and 90s, once Israel started privatizing things like, like the bottle recycling stuff, you know, the kind of powerful bully types were the ones who took over. Aryeh Alperon, who was one of Yaakov's brothers, he sees the government privatizing the bottle recycling, so he forms a company called The Flaming Bottle. And this is in the late 1990s. And of course, you know, he's not going to play nice with the competition. So he basically uses extortion and that sort of bullying method. Bullying sounds like such a, such a weak word for this. You know what I mean? He, he fucking barges in there and he takes over. Yeah, and now the other mob bosses, very not cool. they see this. Yeah, yeah. It was definitely, definitely, there should have been, like, he wasn't just yelling at people on Twitter. You know what I'm saying? Like he was going in there and, and he, he, was, he was just mean about it, you know? Right. And uh, the other mob bosses see this. They see the easy money, and that's when one of the Israeli crime wars kick off. And I, I just, I love the waste management aspect of organized crime, like the simplest industries just being mobbed up, not even controlling unions, literally controlling like recycled aluminum cans becomes this mafioso business that's fought over. Yeah, look, look it's, I mean, it's, it sounds funny when you, when you picture it just as like recycling, but there's, there's a ton of money in it. And also it's, um, organized crime is well situated to do that because, you know, you can deploy a whole lot of guys to go around to a whole lot of restaurants and other types of places, and they will give them their bottles quite quickly, you know? And so you're going to have guys who are able to collect those quite, uh, quite effectively. I think the bottle thing on a personal level, it, it's funny. Obviously, when you read about it, to me, it was always kind of ironic or a little bit funny because not to generalize, but I will. Israelis tend to be um, – <laughs> you know, there, there's, there's kind of a problem with littering here. If you've ever been to a park in Israel after a holiday – uh, when people are barbecuing and all that, I mean, it's trash. So really, for the most part, the only people who are really taking recycling seriously in Israel is, is organized crime. And, and for, for good reason. So back in 2007, they were working to pass a law to change the bottle deposit um, return to where it would also apply to the big, big bottles of Coke, the 1.5 liter soft drinks. And it, this was to help poor families who drink a lot of Coke and all that. A lot of people called it the Alperone Law as a nickname um, because obviously they were the ones to profit in a huge way. Um, but regardless, you know, even if they're looking out for their own interests, I think um, we definitely got to give it up for the Israeli, uh, the Israeli underworld for being the, arguably the country's greatest environmentalist, even if only in one very specific way. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a funny story. It's definitely it's always Earth Day with the uh, with the Alperones. Every day's Earth Day, you know. I mean, these guys, these guys are woke, you know, they're, they're uniting with, with Arab families. They're caring about the environment. Like they are for, you know, they, they're just really, they're progressive. Yeah. I, ahead I of their time, say. ahead of their time. Yeah. Jacob Alperon had very little online clout though. I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't really on, you know, he wasn't, uh, <laughs> he wasn't, the, he wasn't there yet. No. Uh, so they fought this bottle recycling war. All these wars start kicking off in the late nineties and two thousands. And it seems as if every family at one time or another was fighting a war with every other family. The Alperones were originally aligned with the Abergils. They fought with the Rosenstein family and the Abud Bulls and Amir Molnar, who we'll talk about soon. Though soon enough, their alignment with Abergils turned sour. And I know this sounds like a lot, and that's because it really, really is, but we're going to get into to all of it as much as we can. All you need to know right now is that the Alperones had a habit of escaping assassination attempts. That's the other thing too. Like So many of these guys escaped multiple attempts on them. Seven, five, nine, not just the Alperones, but all the other bosses too. By some reports, Yaakov had escaped three. Others had it at nine, but I think, Ben, you said that was his brother who escaped nine attempts? Right, so it was Nisim Alperon was pretty famous for that. He survived nine attempts, if not more. Uh, two of these I covered. I was, I was at the scene, obviously, afterwards, not involved in the uh, planning. <laughs> not involved in the planning, Nisim, if you're out there. Um, one of them was a bomb that blew up on his car in his car on uh, Menachem Begin, in one of the main streets in Tel Aviv, and the other, very close to the courthouse. Uh, the other was a bomb in his Jeep in Ramat Gan on Rashi Street. And um, he, he's one of those mob guys who, whatever his actual status in the underworld was or how big he was or not, um, he definitely photographed well and was on TV a lot because he, partly he had a voice like one of those dudes who has their larynx taken out and just speaks through a voice box. just like, ah, da, da, you know, very, like you never forget this dude's voice. And he also looked, he very much looked the part of a middle-aged Israeli guy who may or may not do extortion work. He also, <laughs> um, 
their family really likes horses. That's a thing that's well known about them. Um, he made actually the international press because he was in the, the Daily Beast. A, a colleague, a friend of mine, Nary Zilber, wrote about him because he, some dudes in the West Banks and Palestinians stole one of his horses, a horse named Tony. I'm assuming that's after Tony Soprano, not Tony Bennett, but I can't confirm. Tony Tony loved horses too. Everyone knows. Yeah, he definitely did. So so basically, it got stolen, taken to the West Bank. He made some phone calls, whatever, and made some connections, and they were able to go out there in the middle of the night and get the horse back, uh, which was a bizarre story. But it's also, again, it's that cooperation. And, you know, these guys, are they're looking out for their bottom line and, and making money and helping each other out. And also, um, that's kind of a cliche thing to a certain extent. Like, you know, you get your car stolen, you can make a few phone calls, and somebody can find where it is. In this case, it was a, it was a horse. It was Tony. <laughs> One story goes that there was a hit team after one of the Alperone family members at one point, but they ended up getting into a shootout with police because they were under surveillance. And I'm actually not sure if the shootout happened because the AP has a similar story about a 2004 hit that was supposedly targeting the Alperones that with these hitmen who had been flown in from Belarus. And this is a quote. In the biggest catch, detectives last month arrested four men from Belarus and 14 Israelis on suspicions they tried to kill several mob bosses. In the apartment of the suspected hitman in a Tel Aviv suburb, Officers found pistols, silencers, assault rifles, anti-tank missiles, explosives, night vision equipment, and hand grenades. They also seized disguises and makeup. Yeah, that's what, I mean, obviously that's, that's a bit, um, that all seems like a lot of hearsay, you know what I mean? Like, um, yeah, definitely that would, that would seem to implicate them. I- November of 2008, Operon's luck runs out. He's killed in a car bombing after leaving a courthouse where one of his sons was on trial for extortion and threats. He leaves behind seven kids, and at his massive funeral, one of them is quoted as saying, I will send back that person to God. He won't have a grave because I'll cut off his hands, head, and body. It's really like a family affair with, with the Israeli crime families, as, as we'll see. Yeah, it's very heartwarming. Um, I, was, I remember the day he was killed because I was, I was at work, and it was one of those types of things. When, whenever there's a bomb or an explosion uh, like that in Israel, the, the way they always like, describe it in, in Hebrew is it like, is it, um, is it nationalist or criminal? So as a nationalist, that means that it's a terror attack. If it's criminal, obviously, it's, it's mobsters blowing each other up. So typically when it's in a you know, specific car and the driver's side seat is blown up by a bomb place there, obviously, you know, it's not a terror attack. Um, obviously, it became very clear who, you know, very quickly that it was Al Peron. You know, it's in the, and it's, again, in the middle of Tel Aviv, one of the busiest junctions in the whole city on Namir, Namir Boulevard. And he's right there. And I remember it was quite grisly. Like there was there were pictures sent in. Um, by the photographers from the scene, and it's like, uh, yeah, about as about as grisly as you'd imagine. A guy getting blown up in his car, not not the way you want to want to go. No, no, not at all. Closed casket. Yeah. Uh, the question is, who killed him? And of course, because of all these wars, there's a laundry list of suspects. In fact, one day after he's killed, two members of the Abergil family are sentenced to prison for conspiring to kill a different brother, Nisim, who we talked about just a minute ago. Because obviously the Alperones have a few with the Abergils over many things, but also because a member of the Abergil family was beaten by the Alperones under, secu- under a security camera at a busy intersection. So that was, that was one of the weirder ones. Um, I always thought that was a weird story because it was where well, the spot that took place is right next to the, the, diamond, uh, the diamond exchange in Ramadan, one of the larger diamond exchanges in, it, in, in the world. And it's a, it's a giant tower called the Migdal Moshe Aviv which was the tallest in Israel at the time. I think it may still be. It's a very phallic, giant building. And a lot of, um, you know, it's got luxury apartments in there. And so some, some mob types live there. And Abarja was living there at the time. And they, they were having some, they were supposed to have some sort of talk outside. And somebody exchanged words. And then they just ran up on, on Itzik Abarja and just started hitting him. And it was Aryeh Alperon, apparently, who was beating him up. Who, if anybody at home could, could look up a photo of Aryeh Alperon, at least in his prime, he very much looked like a, a, um, I would say the most goonish of the brothers like he just he had that face um, of a guy who who does that line of work or let's say dresses for that job and, and definitely like he you know you can see how um, some kind of thing like a hot headed instance who said something y'all are talking shit or whatnot and then next thing you know you got a you know bombs and whatnot 